A few years ago, I decided to take one of those weekends couch surfing, as you do, and to watch a complete boxed set. And the one I chose was Breaking <coughs> Bad. And I'm sure you're all familiar with the story of Walter, the very ordinary American high school chemistry teacher who is diagnosed with cancer and decides, as a way of providing for his family into the future, he'll just cook up some crystal meth and sell it and become a major drug dealer. And watching this series, I was struck by one particular episode, and it's where his wife, Skylar, decides that the family need to sit around and discuss what's happening to them. And clearly the family has actually imploded. And they have no ability to communicate with each other in the best of times, so they're going to find it a bit difficult to communicate in tough times. But Skylar has this idea of the talking cushion. And as you contribute to this family discussion, you have to hold the talking cushion. And it's just awful. It's excruciating. The wheels come off. And it's all summed up by the young son, the teenager, who says, this is bullshit. And you know, I'm a mom of four teenagers, and I work in communications and leadership development. And you know, I consider these things all of the time, but particularly that thing about getting your family to communicate in a healthy and good way, and getting your teenagers to talk to you. Or more importantly, you learning how to listen to your teenagers. Because having considered this for some time, I've come to the conclusion that we're the problem, not the teenagers. We don't give them the time and the space to allow them to share their stuff with us. It's not that they don't want to, but sometimes in the rush of modern life, with the technology, the way we're all rushing around, doing so many things at the same time, we just don't give them the space. Now, I don't have all the answers. I'm only making this up as I go along. But I have a system that works for me, and I'd like to share it with you today. And it's called Family Forum. So what you do is, once a month, you get into a room, you turn off the technology, disconnect the doorbell if you have to, make it nice and comfortable, <coughs> and actually listen and talk to each other. And you know something, a bit of magic happens in that room that I want to be able to tell you about today. But the problem, as I said, is us, it's not the teenagers. Because in the rush and in all that we do, we're constantly telling them what to do. Have you noticed that? Ever since they were little tots and they fall in the playground, you rush in and you pick them up and you kiss them better and you st stick on the sticky plaster. And then all the way up through school, you're fighting at the school gate with the teacher because you want them on the rugby team or you want them on the soccer team or you want them in the orchestra. And we charge in like the cavalry every time they have a problem and we try to fix it. It's in our DNA to do this. We become these awful helicopter parents hovering all the time and never giving them the space to work out who they are themselves and how to solve their own problems. So the forum idea that I started, I discovered this in Washington at, a, at a, an entrepreneurship conference. Now it's often said we need to run our businesses like a family. So that means pull everybody closer to the centre, make them feel valued, make them feel respected, make them feel close to the decision-making process. And so is the converse true that we should also run our families like a business. Now, I'm not suggesting that you hang out a mission, vision and value statement for your family, but perhaps, as I said, just create the space where you can <coughs> interrogate who you are as a family. What are your values? What are your goals? Where are you going? What are you trying to achieve? So I went to this um, leadership conference in Washington and I discovered this system of entrepreneurship forum. So entrepreneurs join a forum in their own area where they will meet with their peers. And I've joined one myself and I sit into this monthly forum with peers. And the beauty of this forum is you can't give any advice. Now for those of you who know any entrepreneurs, you will realise they are the teenagers of the business world. They can be a bit stroppy. They're very directional, they're very single-minded, they know their own mind, and they will not listen to anybody. <laughs> so this system of being in a space where you can get support from your peers without giving or receiving advice is very powerful. So if I go along to my business forum with a problem, hiring and firing, or something that's going wrong with me in my business, and I share it with my peers, they can't tell me what to do. All they can say is, well, you know, last month, I had a similar problem in my business, and here's how it worked out for me. Or they can say, you know, a year ago I hired that person or fired that person and it didn't work out, and here's what I did. So I take away all that perspective, I think about it, and I decide how to solve my own problem. And it's very powerful and it's very interesting. But you can imagine, I came back from Washington full of this, 
Right gang, we're going to do this at home, we're going to do this monthly meeting called Family Forum. And they're going, right, yeah, sure mum. And they're going, what does she want us to do? But you know what it is, I actually intrigued them and I got them interested in taking part in it for this reason. That the whole premise of Forum is based on three principles and you have to vision that like a three-legged stool. It only works if the three-legged stool is in place. If one of these comes off, the stool will fall over. And the three principles are trust and respect, confidentiality, and no advice or language of censure. So trust and respect, that's a great one. You have to trust the process. You have to believe by creating this space that good communication will occur. And as I said, a little bit of magic might even happen in that room. And the respect thing is very interesting because going back to the Breaking Bad, awful, excruciating scene with the cushion, what's going on is as everybody is speaking, everybody else is going, oh my God, throwing their eyes to heaven, rolling, shrugging shoulders, all of this censure. So you have to leave the language of censure, disapproval, disrespect outside the door. And that's a fascinating one because did you know that by the age of 12, Every single child will have heard 100,000 put-downs, rebukes, censures from well-meaning adults, parents, teachers, neighbours, friends. And then we wonder why by the age of 18, 96% of our young adults have self-esteem issues. So trust and respect is huge. It's very important. And the next bit, confidentiality. Oh, they love that one. Believe me, they love it. Because if one of my teenagers shares some experience and they're worried about their friend Marty at school who's going to do the following, I can't run out of the room and pick up the phone and have a big chat with Marty's mother about it. Because one of the things that drives our teens nuts is the way we connect up and have these conversations. I suppose you mothers have been discussing all of that. Or I suppose the dads on the sideline were full of that. They hate it. So they love the idea that this is not going anywhere. And as I said, the language of censure, leave it outside the door. Confidentiality, trust and respect, no advice. So I began explaining this to my teenagers, and I see lights going on all over their faces. <coughs> oh, we're going to have a meeting, Mum. And you're going to listen. Oh, that'll be good. And you're not going to tell us what to do. That'll be excellent. And you're not going to discuss it with your friends. So they got it. Oh, yeah, we'll do that. We're all in. We're going to have that meeting. So I'm delighted, and I'm setting up this first meeting. And we've lit the candles, and we've poured out the drinks and the nibbles, we've closed the door, we've switched off the technology, we're all set to go. And our meeting starts, and I get the land of my life. <laughs> now, I did mention confidentiality, didn't I, when I have my son's express permission to share this story with you. So I have to describe my son to you when he was about five, my second son. He was this little blonde cherub, a little angel with curls. But he had a steely determination about him that was quite interesting and challenging at times. But he decided way back then he was going to study law. And we're not lawyers, we don't know where this came from. But he used to write out these little contracts every time his one of his siblings <laughs> would borrow a ball or borrow a football or borrow a toy. He literally would write out a little contract in legal legal language and make them sign it. I still have some of them, they're very funny. And he carried on all up through school, worked very, very hard, got a great leaving certificate, and went on and got into college doing law. So our first family forum were about, I'd say, four or five months into the first term. And we get the thing going and we get started and he says, I'm leaving law. <laughs> Can you imagine? Had he told me that in the kitchen, standing beside me a few days earlier over a cup of tea, I would have flipped. I would have lost it. I would have said, what are you thinking? But I have set up this environment where I can't be out. <laughs> oh, right. I have to listen. So he begins explaining. He thinks he's too young. He thinks he's rushed straight into college from school. He needs a bit of time, he needs a bit of space. He needs to work, earn some money, grow up a little. And he's already been in and talked to his professor and got the place deferred. And he's already been into the bursar, more importantly, and got the fees deferred. Argued like a lawyer, what could I do? So I already knew on day one we had a bit of magic here. 
this thing was going to work. How were we going to take this forward? We've been doing it now for 18 months. It's working really well for us. As I said, I don't have the answers. This is something I'm making up as I'm going along, but it's working for us so far. So far. Let me explain how forum works. It's not a loose conversation. There's a structure to it. You start with a one-word opener. And that's to kind of get a sense of how everybody is feeling. So somebody might be curious or a bit concerned or a bit, you know, there might be some word that can just a barometer to kind of test where we all are. And then you do a five or ten minute around the houses, around the room to see where everybody is at. And everybody gives an update, which is based on the best and the worst thing that happened to them in their school or college life in the last month. The best and the worst thing that happened with friends and family. And the best and the worst thing that happened in their personal life. <laughs> and if in any of those updates something kind of serious comes up, there might be one issue that's bigger than another, you put it on the parking lot, you let everybody finish their updates, and then you come back to that issue and give it a bit more time. And the big thing is, no advice, only experience shares. My younger son, who's a bit of an actor, is very funny in his experience shares, because I share something that I think is very serious about my business life and my friends and what's going on with me. And he'll say, I have an experienced share. I think you'll find very helpful. And he's very funny. And he'll explain something that happened in his own school or in his own situation. And you very quickly realize that in all the different groups in which we organize ourselves in our society, they're actually all the same. The problems are the same. The interaction is the same. The personal issues are the same. Maybe the size and scale is different. And after you've done the updates then, to go to a deeper level, you can actually do a little presentation. You can ask one person every month to make a presentation about a subject of issue to them. And that is fascinating because our young people are very different to us. And they don't have to follow our course in terms of the choices we've made with our own lives or even the belief systems or the worldview that we have. And to actually hear them explain their views on politics and current affairs and social media, bullying, and any of the issues, it's an eye-opener to you if you create the space and you learn to listen. As I said at the start, we're the problem, not them. If we create this space and let the magic occur, it will occur. What I would like you to take out of this is simply this, that our young people are an incredible mix of talents and skills and abilities and contradictions. And as educators and parents and teachers, we want the best for them. We want to take them forward into the world with the confidence to know that they will contribute in a good way. And I think what we want to get them to understand is they need to take this bundle of brilliance and beauty and put it to the service of humanity. And if in doing so, they can earn their living and make their money, they will be very happy and contented and productive, productive adults. And if we, as the educators, as the parents, as those who are concerned about young people, if we can give them this understanding, we, my friends, will have given them the world. Thank you.